We're back in Gatlinburg on the street talking to people. The question today is a little different is, what's the hardest thing about sharing your faith in today's world? Uh, Cindy, you had a kind of a unique answer. I'm a public school teacher and I have a heart for children and getting children into the church. But uh, just recently, last, just ended Friday Vacation Bible School and was sharing the final message of salvation. And it brought me to tears because I did have children from my summer school class and a student I know I will have this coming year. So I was able to witness to a student that will be in my public school class. But at the same time, when I'm in class, I am unfortunately very aware of what I'm saying. What do you think um, turns non-Christians off about Christianity? I have joy-filled friends but I have friends that see that and say, they can't be that happy all the time. Yes, I get that, yeah, okay. And, and that's unfortunate, but it, it's true. If, if they're joy-filled person and they know where their joy comes from, then. So it almost seems like others might think it's fake. Exactly. Yeah. So Jeff from Ohio, you know, what is hard about sharing your faith in today's world? And you had a pretty uh, good answer. Yes, it's uh, not so much hard, but like I said, uh, it's, more so uh, their surroundings for one, and uh, like some people's, to me it seems like their faith changes day to day. They may be 100% gung-ho one day and then it all depends on who they're around or their setting, it may, it may shift some. So you gotta decide on what you're standing on firm and if you are, do it to the fullest. Well guys, we are back in Gatlinburg and we are back with our friend Matt. I've died in Thailand quite a few times. How you doing? Oh, he's not here. Hope he's not dead. Love that dude. I wasn't raised a Christian, yeah. so I didn't come to God until I was 30. Um, parents were drug addicts and alcoholics, so I wow. always felt like I'd be judged for that kind of stuff. I do share my faith, but it's not something that comes easy to me. Serving comes very easy to me. The actual sharing, I, I just don't feel qualified. I just feel like I'm gonna stumble over myself and not get the point across that it needs to. Now, what do you say, Donna? I kind of gauge with people if somebody's you could tell they're warm and receptive. I'll be more straightforward. With some people, there's a real caution. And so I think that I try to exemplify my faith more than necessarily use my words. What's going on once again Sunday morning? Let me hear you, church. Man, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Once again, we have already locked in with Greensboro. Good morning. We have 20 states, Canada and the Bahamas tuning in with us. Of course, here in Tennessee, April in Florida, Alabama, Lisa and Tim in North Carolina. There is a bunch. The Wileys in Georgia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, Virginia, South Carolina, and the Bahamas. Everybody in the room, give it up for everybody online real quick for us, please. Who has a birthday this month in July? Who has a birthday? Awesome. Listen to this. We've got a special birthday today. You all are special. So what am I saying? You guys are all really special. Our online campus pastor, he's out doing live in the lobby. Give it up for Pastor Mike. It's his birthday today, everybody. He is old. He is old. Just kidding. He's not old. I'm way older than him, I believe. So, but I'm happy to be here, guys. Pastor Brent is off this week, and that is a good thing for him. If you've been around the church any length of time, he does take some time off in the summer. And man, it is not just for him to, to go, and he doesn't just go. He has fun, but that's not the primary um, reason why he goes away. He goes away to kind of get away from the distraction, the everyday routine, and he gets some time one-on-one -on -one with God. And the reason why he does that is because it really um, focuses him for the next couple seasons in the life of our church. So if you are not praying for your pastor, please write it. If you have a prayer journal, write it in there. Pray for him every time that you're praying to God. This is great. It's so good for us. When he has this one-on-one -on -one time, he can really dive in. And God speaks to him. Man, God has been speaking to our pastor since going back to 2020 some of those messages have been unbelievable they have been so good um and uh, and i'll tell you personally 
I love him. He is who he is uh, behind the doors that you guys don't see, who he is on the platform. He talked to me last night. We talked for about five, 10 minutes. Um, he encourages, he uplifts. He's so awesome. We could, I could stand up here for an hour and talk about him. I won't because we'll get to God's word, but let's give it up for our pastor. We love him, right? Don't we? Give it up. While we're in the clapping mood, how about a hand for our band and our 747 worship team? Yes. So blessed. So blessed. If you have a student um, and they, they're not down at the hangar, uh, we'd invite you to come down. We get to listen to that worship every week. We are blessed. That is so great. Not only Scott, Jeanette, Charity, Debbie, um, that whole team that's up here, Pam, every week. Man, we have the next generation. They're so good. We are a blessed church for sure. If you don't know who I am, I'm Pastor Matt. If you're visiting or, um, if, or if you don't know, I, I'm the student pastor uh, down here at the, at the 747 hangar. I get to hang with the 7th through 12th grade, and I love my job. I, I really, really do. But I love moments like this that I get to come up here and speak to you. That video, woo! Man, Mason and I, that was the second time we were on the streets of Gatlinburg doing the man on the street interview. The first time was, I, well, I'll say it was easier because I'm walking up to people and all I'm doing is saying, hey, what is on your bucket list? What do you want to do? And they're like, skydive and travel and scuba dive. It's really easy. Well, this time I'm like, hey, if you're a Christian, um, how hard is it to share your faith in today's world? Or if you're not a Christian, what turns you off about Christians? And people were not as willing to talk. Actually, I had, a, I had a Christian that he walked up and I asked him a question. He goes, listen, I'm a Christian. I'm not afraid to share my faith. I just don't want to share my faith. And he walked away. And I'm like, Gee, wow, okay, that is, okay. Hey, do you, boy? I think he just, I think he was scared of the camera. That there's, people are intimidated by the camera and the microphone. And, and uh, there was one couple, um, actually, they were not a couple dating, but they were two ladies that were walking. I was walking down the streets of Gatlinburg and I looked to my left down this little aisle um, alley with rock ledge and they were sitting there. And, and I noticed one of the girls had a cross bracelet on. And I thought, okay, you know, I think it'd be maybe okay to, to, to talk to them. And um, I walk up and the lady that was sitting next to her had all this uh, pride, sh like a pride shirt on, LGBTQ, um, very out there, everything decked out. And I thought, man, this could be great um, because I, I want to get these, these ideas. And so um, I sit down, I walk up and I go, hey, listen, I'm Pastor Matt and we're doing a series at church. And this is, these are my questions is it hard to be a Christian and, and share your faith in today's world? And the other one is, if you're not a Christian, um, what turns you off about Christians? And they looked at each other, and the lady wearing the pride gear was like, absolutely not, no way. And I'm like, she's like, I'm, you're going to just set me up. You know, I'm like, listen, that's not my intent. My intent is to not make fun of anybody. My intent, this is, this is what I believe, and, you, and I, you can think I'm wrong all you want, but unless we know what is in front of us, unless we know the obstacles that we have with people, we're not going to be able to present Jesus to them in a, in, a, in a way. And so I told her, I was like, I said, listen, my intent's not to make fun of anybody. I just need, I just want to know what's going on. And so they talked, and the other one was even like, you know what, I don't think it's a good idea. Well, as I walked away, they, they, all, they both started giggling, laughing. And, and I overheard them say, it's crazy, because that is exactly both of us. And I thought, wow, I really wish they would have talked, because um, one represented as a Christian, hard to share their faith, the other represented not a Christian, and you know, the, the turning off about Christians. And I, and I thought to myself, man, that goes along with Pastor Brent's message last week. Who was here last week? Raise your hand if you were here. If you were not here, I will say this. I will beg you to watch last week's message. Our pastor hit it out of the park. Absolutely. And the cool thing was, yeah, yeah, clap. Come on, he deserves it. Right? And, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. He, he said some controversial things that the world would say is controversial, but he said it with love. Man, he said it with love. And, and I agree. In that situation, that encounter that I encountered with, me and Mason, um, it was that. They, they apparently have no problem talking about those things together, but somebody random dude coming up, they're like, we're not going to talk to you. Pastor Brent said this, and this was so interesting. He said, it is hard to have... Um, conversations about faith 
if you do not have a relationship with that person, right? We're so good, especially social media in this divided world. We're throwing bombs over the fence, right? And we're just trying to change people's opinion. But unless you have a relationship with them, it's going to be hard to change or at least even have a conversation. He gave four points last week, and I'll recap it real quick. Find common ground with that person. Second one was make others feel accepted. This one can get taken out of context. Well, I don't need to accept their lifestyle. No, no, he's, he's saying this. He's saying, listen, you can draw a line in the sand and say, my faith, the way I live my life, I, I won't cross those boundaries. I won't cross into that sin, though I can still love you. I can still have a conversation with you. Make them feel accepted enough to come to the table. The third thing was be sensitive to the needs and concerns of others. And the last one was look for opportunities to talk to people about Christ. Do we do that? I talk about, talk about praying for your pastor. Do you pray that God give me an opportunity to talk to Bill in the elevator on the way to work? Hey, God, give me an opportunity. Give me the right words so when I see Jane that I can, I can explain to her kind of things that I'm going through, maybe that I see that she's going through now. Do we, do we pray for those opportunities? This series, if you would dive into the minds of the creative team with the bucket list series, I think we would probably say this is going to be such a good series. It's going to be kind of light. It's going to be fluffy a little bit. It's going to be a great summer series to kind of away from the road trip. It'll be fun. And it has been really, really great. But Scott made a great point. He sent a, a message to the, the, the creative team, to the staff, and said, this series has some teeth. Right? It's got some bite to it. It's not just fluffy. There are some intense messages, like we said last week. And Pastor Brent has been anchoring on three points. If you have not written this down yet, please, please write this down right now. The three points of this series. Live life intentionally. Identify what's important. And invest in God's kingdom. Live life intentionally. and Identify what's important. And invest in God's kingdom. For me, this message today, I feel like all three of those points are in it. It's not because of something that I did. I, I think God is the author of creativity, as Pastor Brett would say. I love it that I could be sitting on the beach and I can get this idea right from that song. My favorite line in that song, tell the world, tell it, I'm a billboard. Y'all hear when they, were, when they were saying that, right? We're a billboard. You're a billboard. I'm a billboard. I was sitting on the beach on vacation and I'm under the tent because I don't like just to sit and bake, right? So I'm, and I'm looking out at the ocean and it's beautiful and I'm just like, oh, this is so great. God's masterpiece. And then in the corner of my eye, I see this big boat, and this boat is floating down parallel to the shore, and there is a big LED screen on it advertising a bar where I can get a beer and a fried grouper sandwich. Now, I'll eat that grouper sandwich all day. I love me some fried grouper sandwich, right? And I'm thinking, first thought was, man, that's kind of a bummer that, you know, that that's kind of taken the, the beautifulness away, you know, when that comes by. But then I thought, well, I mean, Everyone's going to see it because I did. And then not too long later, an airplane flew overhead with a banner on the back of it. Let's go parasailing and, and all that. You know, we live in like the billboard capital of the world. I don't think that's true. But I'm going to just say it because there's billboards everywhere, right? We're Sevier County. You can drive down like you're going to Gatlinburg. Pancakes, 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 pancakes. <laughs> right, right. There's billboards everywhere. You're a billboard. I'm a billboard. You know, billboards, what do they do? They advertise something, right? They represent something. So if we're billboards, what are we representing? Who are we representing? Psalm 107 verse 2 says this, all of you set free by God. Who is that? Everybody that would say Jesus is the Lord of their life. You're a Christian. That is a, all of you set free by God. Tell the world. Everybody say, tell the world. Tell the world. Tell the world. That's what we're called to do. Do we do it? It all comes down to influence. It comes down to the influence that we have. I have to, have to navigate a little bit more on social media than I probably normally would being the youth pastor. 
You have things on there like a blue check, platinum play button. Some of you are like, what does that even mean? It means that you're really there. You've made it, right? Some of you are nodding. Um, Platinum play buttons, blue checks, a stadium, say, chanting and wearing your name on their jersey. Think about this influence, like these amazing people in our world. If fame is the power that comes from being known by many people, which I think we can agree with, right? Um, That could be good or bad, being known by many people. So if fame is the power of being known by many people, what happens when the all-powerful and all-knowing wears your name? Does it change how we move in this world? What happens when we're given more than influence, when we're given a power to change the world? But the real question is, do we really believe we have that power? If so, what happens when we use that power for the good of others and help them and give them hope? In Luke 10, 2, it says, He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Who's heard that verse before? Right? Some, most, most of you. Most of you in this room have been a Christian longer than I have. I've been a Christian 11 years. It's going to be 12 soon. I love that. It's good. Hey! <laughs> Best decision I've ever made in my life. There, there are youth in my youth ministry that have been a Christian longer than I have. And listen, um, it wasn't long ago that I was over here and I've, I lived in, in a world where I tried to fill that void with everything else besides Jesus. Right? And this is what I think. And you could disagree, maybe. Um, I believe in the last 11 years, there is no better time to be a Christian and to share your faith than right now. And you're like, that doesn't make any sense. The world is divided. It is hard to be a Christian. We, I mean, we're getting persecuted. It seems like more now than ever. Listen, I said there's no better time. I didn't say it was an easier time. But I believe it's a better time because I was there, right? I was right there. When the world gets darker, I believe the light shines brighter. And it is true. And listen, Jesus, he will overcome. His word, he will overcome that darkness. And people need it. I get to deal with youth. I get to deal with youth parents that have never walked into a church ever before. And when I get to sit down and talk to them about, listen, the struggles that you're going through, I was just there. So, so listen, if, if Jesus can help me and if he can change me, I promise you, give him a shot. Lean on him. You need to believe that he can change you too. And when they hear that, they're, they give, gives them hope. Like, really? Are, he can even help me? Tell you what, it's powerful. It's not easy. It's not easy, but it's powerful. I think all of us are in three stages. Um, we're going to fit into one of these stages in, in our life. The first one, the non-believer. Well, what do you mean by that? If you do not, uh, if you do not profess that Jesus is the Lord of your life. If you say, you know what, um, I have not accepted Christ. I do not live that way. And you're a non-Christian. If you are here and you are a non-Christian, thank you. Thank you for being here. And let me tell you something. If that is you and I'm talking to you or I'm talking to you online, listen, you're here, you're listening, and you're here for a purpose. You're not here by accident. You're not listening just because, oh, randomly, my friend sent me a link. No, no, no. God's orchestrating this. You are here for a reason and purpose. So I pray today that your heart is softened and that wall is brought down so you can listen to the truth. Then you make your choice. Then you make your decision. But thank you for being here. The the second group, I would say, are the Christians that are running the race, that are all in. We know people like that, that just ooze Jesus. And I'm not talking about in a way that is weird and that they really turn you on. They're like, cuckoo, right? And we're not talking about people like that. Talking about those people that are authentic and real and they love Jesus. We all know people like that. Do we all know people like that, right? I can think of some right now. I'm like, man, they just ooze it. It's so great. And the third group. And this is, not to, this is not to pick on anybody. I do feel like God gave me this to maybe convict people. And convict is a good thing, right, to make you think. The third group is Christians that are on the sideline. Some people, I think, put it in, in, into the analogy of a sporting event, a game. 
that you're on the sideline, you know how to play, you know the rules, you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that you love God, but man, there's something there that you're scared or you're nervous or you don't know how to do it, you don't feel, so you don't go in the game and you, and you sit back. Growing up, the most influential people in our lives varies, but I would say teachers. Teachers are amazing. Um, my music teacher was one. My grandpa was another one that was very influential in my life. Think about that in your life. Was it your parents, another teacher, maybe a coach that was very influential, maybe a youth pastor or a pastor? The world, they tell about influence in a little different way. I, did, I looked up the study, and on Instagram, um, some of you, Instagram is just Facebook for younger people. Some of you don't know what Instagram is. Um, and Instagram did this study about the most influential people in the world. The first one was Cristiano Ronaldo. Who know, anyone know who that is? Raise your hand. Soccer player, right? There's like three people that like soccer in this church. Great. <laughs> Frank told me it is the world's most popular sport, but it's like the ninth in America. It's okay. It's okay. Right? Cristiano Ronaldo's got 366 million followers. Wow, that's a lot. Number two, Kylie Jenner, 281. I don't know who that is, to be honest with you. I'm kind of, uh, I, I'm maybe not as cool as I thought I was. The third one, Dwayne The Rock Johnson at 278. I say that and everybody loves The Rock, right? I hate that they keep asking me to be a stunt double, but it's, it's all good. It's all good. You got to do what you got to do, all right? But that influence, right? The crazy thing about those people and the people that have influence in today's culture is when they talk, People believe it, and they believe it like that is truth. So one person that has 366 million followers can have an opinion, and if they're passionate about that opinion, they can sway so many people. The power of that influence is, is amazing, right? I had a student that came up to me, and we were talking about Adam and Eve, and we were talking about how the, the whole Genesis story came to be, and she asked me, and she said, listen, how does that, how does that what do you believe? And I said, well, I believe what the Bible says, and we talked about it, and I say, but you, I thought you believed the same, and she's like, I did, but then, you know, there's this YouTube influencer that I, I really like, and she's really great, and she said this, and I think I believe that now. It's crazy how, how much power that they have. Some of you are like a YouTube influencer. It's a thing, for real. They just give their opinions and they try products and they do, and people follow them and watch them and they make like $100,000 a year. Some of you are in the wrong job. I'm just telling you, right? But it's crazy. It's amazing how much we listen to these people of influence. So who thinks they're an influencer? Raise your hand up in here. This has happened every service. Like two people raise their hand, right? Why don't you think you are? I think it's because the word influence or influencer has been hijacked, right? Because we feel like we don't have millions of followers. We don't feel like we're an influencer. But the definition of influence is this, to affect or alter by indirect or intangible means. Like she attempted to influence his decision. But I'll tell you this, just because we don't have millions of followers, that doesn't mean that you don't have influence with people. God uses people. He had all throughout the Bible. Leads us to our scripture today. John 4. We're going to start in chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, pull them out. This message, this scripture I love. Our pastor spoke on this a couple years ago. And I loved how he preached the woman at the will. I really did. My angle's going to be a little bit different. Some of you are like, well, I've already heard this. Listen, I need you to listen to me as I read through the scripture. This isn't Matt talking. I have a lot of scripture because I believe that the scripture will be able to soften hearts and change lives today. I really, really believe that. So John 4, chapter 4, read along with me. If not, it'll come on the screens. Now, he had to go through Samaria. This is Jesus. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Stop. I've said this all week. Um, 
I'm weird. My brain goes like crazy. You know that tune, American Woman? That, we should write that song. Samaritan Woman, stay away from me. I, if you got any ideas, send it to me, email, right? All right, getting back to it, getting back to it. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Yes, he is, right? Who gave us this well and drank from it himself as so his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now listen, Jesus is the man and you can read this scripture over and over again. Every time you read it, it's like you've heard Pastor Brent say this, that the Bible is a living, breathing thing. What he means by that is depends on what season of life you're in, if you're in a storm, if you're in a struggle, if you're happy, if you're great, right? That when you read something in the Bible and you've already read it, it it relates to you even different. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. This is an interesting part of that scripture because when you read scripture over and over again, you read the same story You've heard Pastor Brent talk about this. You've heard other preachers say this. God's word is living and breathing, right? What that means is this. That means that where you are in the season of your life, if you're going through a storm, you're going through a struggle, um, if everything is great, you're going to read the Bible and you're going to get something out of it. But then you can read the same scripture and you can get something else out of it. The first time I read that, I thought to myself, "Ooh, Jesus, is that a little harsh? No, you don't have a husband. You've had five. And the one you're living with right now, uh, you know, I, I really thought was like, man. But this is, this is interesting because now that I feel like I'm getting wiser in reading God's word and listening to wisdom in, in the teaching, that Jesus is not trying to be a jerk here. I truly believe that Jesus is trying to tell this woman, let, let, let's be honest, get your cards out on the table because I believe this, that if you do not lay out your struggles and your sin, if you do not lay it all out, you're never going to get to that next level. If you're struggling with a sin, if you are fighting with your spouse, if you are having um, issues with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, whatever it is, if you do not lay it all out, you're never going to reach get to that next step. I, I bring this example up with one of our youth and, and I would never say his name, but I'm allowed to talk about the story. I love this guy. He's one of my favorites. They're all my favorites, right? And he came in and he said, Pastor Mike, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, buddy, what's up? And, and we sat down and I said, you struggling with that thing again? And, and he goes, yeah, yeah, I am. And I go, I, I knew you were because if you weren't here today that I was gonna call you because every time that you struggle with that thing in your life, I noticed that you, you kind of you run away and, and we don't see it for like three or four weeks. The best part about it is he remembers, he acknowledges it, and he comes back, right? And, and I think about with this woman right here, if we don't lay out all the struggles and the sin in our life, we're not going to be able to overcome it. Using that analogy with the youth, listen, I know that there's people in our church that watch online. Listen, our online campus is amazing. It is the perfect tool for people to get plugged in, especially if you can't make it in church. But I know this to be fact, that there are some people that are struggling with something so much that they don't feel worthy enough to come into the church building. So they'll watch it online. Because they'll feel icky that they're not worth it. And, I, and I'll say this. If that is you watching online, I, I will say this. If you know somebody in your life, people here, we're going to hug you. We're going to welcome you. We want you to know that we are here for you. This is a family. We can't let this whole picture of lift the rug up and let's sweep all of our problems up just to hide it. And we can put on this face that's not good. We've all seen the cartoons when we stuff it in the closet and then we open the closet and what happens? It all like shoots out at you. Lay it out in the open. 
That's the only way that you're going to overcome and get better. If not, it's like acid, like eating away from the inside out. This next part is huge. Verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you. I am he. Super powerful moment. First time that Jesus says he's the Messiah and he reveals himself to a woman in Samaria. Crazy. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of town and they made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then the disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him some food? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying that it's still four months until harvest? But I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Look at our world today. Look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. This is what I'm after. 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came out, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many became believers. They said to the woman, we, are no longer, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. The woman at the well became a huge influencer. So the world tells us, We're not an influencer. Listen, God uses people. God uses us. The harvest is plentiful. I think another tactic of the enemy is to keep us passive, kind of in defensive mode. I think it's easier to do that. I had a a, a pastor that I talked to, not not in this county, but... I was talking to him and he was a youth pastor and I was talking to him about his youth program and, and I love picking the brains. Some of us get together and we go to lunch, some of us youth pastors, it's a really cool thing. And this pastor I was talking to and I said, hey, what do you do to encourage your, your students to get more people to come to church? What's working? What's not working? Because, you know, we, we're, we're on the team, we're on the same team. And he said, well, to be honest, I don't really want any more. And I, and, I, and I was like, wait, I misunderstood what you said. What did you say? And he said, listen, we're a small church, and I like being a small, I like being a pastor of a small church. If we got any more students, I would, I would leave and go to another church. Now, listen, I, I, I know he believes in God and he loves God, but I told him, I said, well, what do, you, what do you think about Jesus calling us to do that? Us, We have a command for us to do that. He's like, well, that's just, that's just what I think. What I think, I don't encourage him to invite anybody. It kind of broke my heart because I do feel like the enemy can use that for bad, for evil, for negative. And we can live this passive defensive mode. But Pastor Brent did a message in 2020, and I loved it, about us going on the offense for our faith. I think we have to. It's not easy being a Christian in today's world, and that's an adult or a teenager. It's not easy. But we've got to do it. We know the Bible tells us over and over again that we're going to be persecuted, but we still got to fight. We've got to go on the offense. The youth get a bad rap all the time that they're lazy. They don't do anything. But listen, I will tell you this. I've been around a lot of different, you know, generations of people. There is no bigger passionate generation than the youth are right now. They're passionate people. They will fight for what they believe in. Sometimes their beliefs are different than our beliefs, right? But they're passionate. It could be fighting for the sea turtles, right? They're fighting and they will continue to fight. They are passionate people. Just think how amazing would it be if we can help guide them to be passionate for Jesus. They could be that generation that can influence the world for Christ, They don't need a huge platform. God uses people. He always has used people. We tell the story of who we were before Jesus and who we are now. We live in a world today where we value comfort more than we value purpose. I think that's true. It's easy. The distractions can grab us. They don't want us to be 
on fire for Jesus. They want us to kind of be numb to the world. We're more isolated than we've ever been before. We have so much information. We don't know what is real, what is fake. We're, we're in a time, listen, we, we understand that we've all been in times throughout the history of Christianity. We've had people say, yeah, is Christianity even real? I don't know. I doubt it. Maybe it is. We've had people doubt it. But the wording is different now. I think it's, is Christianity even good? That's what the world is telling us today. Is it even good? Well, Matt, I can't, I can't be used by God because I screwed up and I did this and I did this. That is, a, that is the go-to tool by the enemy for sure. If you would have known me 12, 13 years ago, man, only God could do that transformation. Some of you have stories exactly like that. It's amazing. But let, listen, yesterday ended last night. God's graces are new every morning. We have to, we have to understand the yes, listen, we beat each other up. We beat ourselves up almost more than others beat us up because we feel like we're not worthy. We're not worth it. But if God can use the woman at the well, if God can use these, these flawed people, he can use you. He can use me. His graces are new every morning, but it's tough. So I want to close with Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Who's heard that verse before? Right, we, we, we have. I love it. One thing Pastor Brent's been doing is been supplementing some of his scripture with the message translation. And, and I say this to the youth a lot because um, they come in and, and they'll have a translation of the Bible and they're just like, hey, I don't get it. Man, I don't get it. Some of you are like, there's one translation and one translation only. This is what I tell, this is what I tell my youth. I was like, God is powerful. God's word will jump off the page. Find something that, that makes sense to you. Because if you're reading something that doesn't make sense, like you need something that, that you can go, oh, I can relate to that. And so the message translation is one of those versions that makes it just pop out and it's kind of like every day. And I use it as supplement with my translation. And in it's Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. What does that mean? It means... In everything you do, give it to God as an offering because he can use it. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Verse 2, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. The woman at the well, leaving her water jar, she went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Found people, find people. You're a billboard. What are you representing? What are you saying? We know what the woman at the well was saying. Well, that's all good. But man, Matt, I still don't feel comfortable. I don't, I don't feel like I'm equipped. I feel like I, I hear everything you're saying, but I still don't know. Why do we even have to do it anyway? Why? Listen, somebody loved you enough to share the truth with you. Build relationship with people and share the truth with them. And that's not just because I say it or Pastor Brent says it. It's because Jesus says it. In Matthew 28, the Great Commission, this is what he says. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Everybody say, Go. go. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That word commission 
It's an instruction, a command, a duty given to a person or a group of people. You're that group of people. I'm that person. Jesus himself has given us that command. With your life, how are we doing? So this is what I want to do to close. The band's going to come up and the singers are going to come up and they're going to, they're going to close with a song by the band Cain. And the song is called The Commission. Jim mentioned this Wednesday. It was like, I cannot believe that it took this long for, for somebody to write a song about the Great Commission. But it's so beautiful. The first time I heard it, I was riding with my son and he heard it before, him and his mom and his sister listened to it in the car. And he's like, Dad, have you heard this new song, this new song? And, and, I, and I, we played it and it brought tears to my eyes. It's beautiful. I believe that our team that sing, that's going to sing it for you just now even does a better job than Cain. Cain, I know you're listening. I love you guys. You're great. But I'll say this. Put, your, put, your, put some action to your faith. While they sing the song, we're going to open the altar. This has been very good last night, today. Think about somebody in your life that you can share your faith with, somebody that you've wanted to, somebody that you know does not know Jesus, that you can think, oh, God, give me the right words, give me the opportunities to share my faith with them. We all know people like that. Think of that person. Come up to the altar. Pray for them. Pray for that opportunity. If you don't know Jesus, if you are here and you don't have a relationship with Christ, come to the altar and give your life to him. If you're struggling, if you feel like you're on the sidelines and you wish that you got that fire back, come to the altar and ask for that fire to be reignited in your life. People will be up here and they'll be praying for you. Use us. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity all week. Just talk from, from our heart. Talk from your word about sharing, sharing our faith. What, what examples we have in the Bible that you can use anybody. There is nobody that cannot be used by you. Doesn't matter what we've done yesterday. Yesterday ended last night. Doesn't matter the struggles that we faced. God, we repent to you and you can use us. So with the people out here, God, that are wondering who those people are in their life, make a way where there seems to be no way. Soften hearts, drop walls. We look to you, lean on you. In your wonderful name we pray, amen.